Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here in St. Paul, St. Thomas. I'm Derek Anderson. I'm the CTO of Plotless. I'm one of these weird Silicon Valley CTOs, so I obviously just wear t-shirts and shorts when I go around and speak to people. Um, I've worked at some places you may have heard of, PayPal, Walmart Labs, eBay, LG Electronics. I lived here in Minneapolis, St. Paul for 13 years. Then I fled and went out to Silicon Valley where I thought it would be cool because I watched that HBO show and it looked really neat, but then I got there and realized that show was real and it was really like that. So then I fled and came back here. And now I'm out in Sioux Falls. I don't know if anybody knows of South Dakota. Sometimes. Okay, so let me tell you about my company, uh, Blockless, wearing a t-shirt, obviously. That's what we have to do. So Blockless is a new kind of paradigm in web, and I don't want to say it's new because we've been doing distributed decentralized servers for a long time. We all used to get kicked off of our ISPs when we run on port 80, and that's still kind of a thing today. But what we're trying to do is really kind of reinvent what you would think would be the story around containers and computing at the edge, but also computing within community. So really what's kind of important to us is to allow community members like yourself to run servers at home, but servers that aren't specific to you, they're generic, so anybody can use them. And you can think about this as AWS Lambda, GCP, or Cloudflare functions, with the shift is that you own the network, your community owns the network, what your organization, what your demographic wants to do with that network is up to you. We do have a network where everybody can participate and we will host you, so you can just launch directly on us, give us a try. We load balance across a whole bunch of different providers, including GCP, AWS, and, and we'll work on that as we go through this talk. We've got a remarkable amount of information to get through in 40 minutes, and this is a very big campus, so I know some of you have a, a long way to walk if you're going to another talk, so we'll try to make sure that we get wrapped up. Uh, around that time. What Blockless really aims to do, if any of you really kind of look at SDKs and you kind of go out and look in the market, you're pretty much aware that kind of developing really sucks. We all kind of pick our one niche and our focus and we specialize in that. And it doesn't matter if it's a, a language or an SDK kit or an API, you really kind of just focus on that. And so in the Web3 and the crypto world, if show of hands, everybody's been following what's been kind of going on. Okay, well maybe not. So there's a lot of tribes, like a lot of tribes. And I'm talking like, if you think that right now, oh, excuse me, Web2 has like a lot of differentiation in APIs, Web3 is almost exponentially towards 300, 400 APIs that you as a developer would have to interact with if you wanted to build in this ecosystem. And that's because everything is new. Next year will be a new API. The year after that, somebody else will come up with an idea and, and probably get somebody to fund it and then put it out and build on it. So kind of, you know, I want to talk more, what is Web3, what does it really mean for Blockless? Okay, so if we start back with what Web1 was, really it was all of us kind of starting our own internet servers, maybe starting an FTP server to share some files. Fast forward, we got this cool thing called Napster, we got BitTorrent, now we're sharing with each other, we're talking to each other outside of IRC or regular chat channels. And we kind of started moving towards what would become Web2. Google, AWS, we were okay with handing over our data. So we really didn't have data in the Web1 era because nobody really kind of knew how to build web apps. They were really fancy pages with GIFs and blink tags and marquee tags. Then we get to awesome Gmail times, you know, around 2005, 2007, and we're like, whoa, this is what a web app can do. Now we start handing over a lot of data. Everything about us. Facebook knows who you are. Target at one point, I don't know if anybody here is working for Target, but at one point their mobile app could predict when a woman was pregnant. So if she went and bought specific things at Target, it would already correlate that data using AI way back in, in, in the early uh, decade to say that this person was, was pregnant and knew too much about people. So now go to Web3. Web3 is really the paradigm shift that you own your data. You keep hearing about weird things like crypto wallets and self-custody, and that's cool and all. You'll see that fade away over time. We'll end up going back to some kind of custody where you'll trust an entity to control your identity. We already trust the government to kind of give us an ID, and, and we fly with that, we leave the country with that. So it's only going to kind of collapse the same way. But the idea really is that the entity that is providing you with services, the corporation, when you're doing commerce, 
doesn't really need to keep your data. You own that data, you share that data, and you take it with you to the next provider. So this is kind of what's happening in the medical industry with medical uh, portable uh, records. The rest of the tech industry is following suit. You'll hear things like Local First Web, Socket Supply Company. Um, it's really it's coming for everybody uh, at this point. So it's a, a big shift in the way that we interact today because us as developers, we really need to be cognizant that we can't store that data. And if we just look, I think it was just last week, um, I believe uh, it, was, it was Facebook Meta got fined 1.3 billion by the EU by simply just you know moving data to the to the states because there is no data agreement between the United States and the EU. So it's it's really kind of hairy for us as developers. So Web3 actually is, is really helping us because it, we leave the data there. So what does that mean? You know, like what does blockless kind of do for that? So let's kind of start talking about now key technologies within Blockless, because even though I'm talking about Web3, what I really want to kind of share with you is what's happening in the industry that I and my company really are just echoing. So we just got back from Boston a couple weeks ago where there was a huge summit and all of the companies that are building these kind of technologies came together and we really kind of discussed what we're doing. So these are the trends that you can kind of keep in line and when you're following this you know, method, Go ahead and, and look at some of this stuff after the talk. So IPFS right now means interplanetary file system. It's the largest distributed storage system in the world currently. They have an entire algorithm around you at home running a node that will replicate data that people want to store. It's a very smart algorithm in that it only stores the most used data at the edge. The rest of it gets sapped away in what's called an archival node. Nobody ever touches it. They can come back hopefully in 100 years and pull it when they need it, but it will never be at the edge. LibP2P is something that a lot of the industry is building on. So if you ever thought that you wanted to build a peer-to-peer -peer application, but you didn't know how, look into LibP2P. It takes care of all of the really hard things for you, such as civil attacks, peer-to-peer -peer channel flooding, and there's a whole bunch of mechanisms allow, to allow you to actually connect nodes together. You still have to write protocols and communication protocols and channels around how your applications talk. But this library is available in Rust, Go, JavaScript. You can find it in a plethora of languages. And a lot of people in the industry are using this when we're talking about writing alternatives to Kubernetes control planner KCP. And WASM. So you see WASM is kind of taking over now slowly. So it started in the web, and it was going to augment JavaScript. JavaScript sucked. The JVM sucked. Let's go ahead and write a new language that tar targets 95% of native compilation. You can use C, you can use Python, you can use Rust, Go, whatever language you want that compiles to WASM. You can compile down to this target language. There's an interface then that you can interact with. We are using this as the base of our function as a service. And really we'll get into kind of why it really kind of helps us reach the goal of being agnostic. Because we want to be on IoT, we want to be on Android, mobile, kind of everywhere. And we even want you to be able to just open up your web browser and earn some money while you're sleeping, right? Just pop open earn.com and, and let people compute on your device. Okay, so, so to dive a little bit more into how IPFS works. So as I mentioned, the protocol itself is a method for storing data, and it stores any arbitrary data. It doesn't have to be binary data, it doesn't have to be ASCII or text data. Uh, it could be uh, ephemeral data, and you actually don't want it to stay around, so it actually has the time to live as well. Uh, the addresses on IPFS then allow every piece of data to be addressable. So anything that you upload into this, even if I upload the same file that you upload, will get one address back from the hash. So as we all know, we MD5 or SH1, some file, we get the hash back, it kind of works just like that. It's inspecting to make sure that the contents of the file, the binary data of the file, haven't changed before it gets uploaded to the chain. And it does this using an interesting format. So you would think that somebody would just invent something brand new to kind of do this, but the team behind this was really kind of clever. We already have tar, right? Tar is already an archival format. It deals with ASCII, it deals with binary, it can be compressed, it decompressed. So what if we just add a hash table to it? Boom, the car file was invented. So now we have a new binary file where you can actually have something that's similar to a container format. It's like a zip file, but it's not a zip file. Every piece of information you put in there, including the directory recursion structure, 
So if you have folder A inside folder B, then all of those folders will be hashed and summed. And that file then is distributed to the IPFS interplanetary system. And what that means is that files inside the car file as they're accessed are actually floated to the top of the storage mechanism and things that are less prevalent are kind of weighted. So what happens is if you upload a car file with an image Linux that's dated for today, but five years from now, the only thing you needed to update was that Linux image and not the rest of the car file, that Linux image would simply just go away and vanish and be moved to archival, while the Linux image that was being used would float to the top and still be referenced in the same car, Merkle tree. It's a very interesting system where you can just change files at will without ever changing addresses. And so what does it really mean in terms of how we're going to use this uh, for containers? So car files, as I mentioned, they're kind of an independent way to package files that will be transported over a mechanism. You can then use them locally. You can unpack them. You can add the things to them, and not just binary. So you can add your WASM executions to this. You can add bin files to them. You can add your SVGs or your TXT files to them and then process at the edge with your application. Uh, I kind of compare this all the way down to how you would kind of relate to maybe what a Docker image would be and why a car file is a little bit better than saying what a Docker image. How many people have, have pulled a Docker image down and kind of sat through that pain? Right. So you're sitting there, it's a fresh image, and you look, 250 megs for this layer, cool. All right, 250 megs for this layer, cool. 250 megs for this, so like nine layers later, you're a gig and a half in, and all you wanted to do was run a Python server in an Arch Linux distribution, which if you did it by hand, probably would have been 100 megs if you're you know, putting everything in it. Um, so the car file, again, because it's built on blocks and not built on a binary uh, instrumentation of just what the image is, you don't just have to take down large, huge chunks and snap them together once you get to the destination. They can be snapped together like Legos before you actually transport them over the wire by using the car references. So again, it's I deployed one in two years ago, I come to deploy one this year, I'm gonna reference files that already exist on the chain, but I'm gonna add new files. Then I'm gonna submit that car file to IPFS, it's gonna upload only the new files that don't have any hashes that exist, and then it's going to create a, a marker for the car reference or the container, referencing all of the old files that existed because they're still popular, they're still used, and boom, my new files are there as well. And then again, all this gets distributed at the edge. So as you have storage mechanisms that are sitting in Miami, storage mechanisms that are sitting in LA, storage mechanisms sitting in New York, the user is now closer to that data. And again, we can go across borders as well, London, anywhere in the EU, other places that are way more hostile towards data movement, like Turkey, they require you to have compute in the nation. You can't even compute outside the nation of Turkey. So really moving compute to the edge is one of the only ways that you will gain access to some of these target demographics. Okay, so now kind of to move in a little bit uh, to P2P and what that really kind of means for Community, and you heard me kind of spiel about, you know, Blockless is really here to continue to drive community, and we really want community to drive this, and, and really what does that mean? So, as I mentioned, we're using libp2p to do kind of this communication protocol. And what that means is that when you bring up a node on the Blockless network, your node will connect either to our network, you don't have to, you can set up your own network and terminate at your own subnet, but you can join our network and your workers will then catch broadcasts from our P2P workers. Anybody can come and submit to what we call a head node or an anchor node. It's really a control plane. You submit a job, and that job is then broadcasted out to any of the workers that are available. Because the car file could be next to any of these workers, the workers that are close to the edge, they'll pull the car file in, they'll execute your workload, whether it's WASM or an x86 emulator, and then they'll return the results, disappear, go off and do their own thing, and, and you get to save the money, you get to save the electricity, and hopefully you're also providing the services to people. But then, yeah, I keep talking about WASM too, so I know there's a big, like a jumble of a bunch of stuff going in here, so trying to continue to tell an entire story about something that's really complicated that's being built. So WASM is now really kind of taking over holistically. Like I mentioned, 
it was originally just part of an augmentation in the web browser for performance on JavaScript. And it didn't really work that well because nobody wants to write in WASM that writes JavaScript, let's just be honest. Like, it takes a while to change how you want to write. Rusters, C people, they love writing in WASM because they've already got these memory constraints kind of in their memory, I guess. And so really kind of what this means in terms of adoption is that it hasn't really gained adoption in the web. But where it's really kind of growing super big now is on the server. Ha 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 ha. Invented for the client, but now really running on the server. And the reason being is that if you've ever built for WASM, is anybody building WASM targets today? Probably very few. Again, yeah, it's, it's, it's very small. But it's a machine in and of itself. So normally you would target Windows, you target Linux, you target OS X, you target your 32-bit, your 64-bit, maybe your ARM, your AMD, it's explicitly where you expect to deploy this binary. There's obviously been things that have helped, like the Java virtual machine and doing Java, and writing in an interpreted machine, Python or just JavaScript, and running it on those where the binary's already been compiled for you. But now with WASM, you don't really have to worry about that. You can just compile to something called generic. And every WASM machine understands generic. And so generic means about 90 to 95% of the performance structure. There's some more semantics around it because there's this cool thing called WASI, which is just WASM with an I instead of an M. And it allows us to actually write the interfaces to the system that you're using. So WASM by nature is super secure because you're not allowed to actually touch anything outside of the sandbox itself. And then let's combine everything kind of together here uh, in, into one. So we take you know, uh, a minimal distribution potentially of, of Linux that can either run an adopter, it can run natively, um, but it really relies on kind of centralized services. So we're swapping that out for decentralized services. We're using WASM and content uh, archives or cars to really kind of swap what you think would be normal Linux images, system images, and Docker containers. So the car then becomes our outer container format. It's an easy to use tar. You can inspect it with regular tools on your desktop. You can see and enumerate files inside without needing to do anything special. It's just a tar file. We've also built an x86 emulator that runs in WASM. So now you can run all of your legacy applications at 32-bit anywhere on the edge. If you want to run them on Android, if you want to run them on a Jetson, if you want to run them in uh, a Mac, if you want to run them in the cloud, it'll run the same everywhere. The performance obviously isn't perfect. If you ever use two EMU uh, on a non-target machine like, a, like an AMD to an ARM, um, but it's amazing to watch it happen because I, as a developer, no longer need to actually worry about what target device I'm actually trying to build to, or even who's hosting what I'm, I'm running. I just execute it, get my results, and I move on. We're also using this thing called Filecoin. So you heard me mention IPFS FS a lot, excuse me. Filecoin is like a cousin to IPFS. It's run by the same foundation. It's the system that does the Edge CDN. So we don't actually have to host the Edge CDN ourselves. Our Edge CDN is all community driven as well. By people participating in Filecoin, it means that we've already got distribution at the Edge wherever these Filecoin nodes are, and they have like tens of thousands of them. Okay, so that sounds like it's like a lot of uh, cool stuff that's obviously all open source, right? So you can check all that stuff out, but really then what kind of makes Blockless special is how we're taking this open source into spare compute. So this portion might be a little eye glossy uh, for people who are looking at more of the technicals, um, but really Blockless itself is making its path by identifying spare compute that actually exists in your communities and finding the people that are reliable for your community to provide that compute. And so what that means is as you kind of position yourself to have community members running these beacon software for you that are gonna execute your application payloads, it will actually surface those members in your community who are reliable, trustworthy, keep their computers on, have the fastest computer, upgrade their computers regularly. We're actually tracking this matrix across the life of these nodes during this execution cycle, and we actually dole work out to them as this works. So this allows you then to really own your community network. You're not going to an anonymous site of community-driven people like Ethereum or Bitcoin 
and trying to work on something that's a blockchain, you can actually drive your own adoption by people who are interested in the vertical that you're actually operating in, whether it's science, whether it's uh, entertainment or leisure. Uh, those people can really take advantage of it. And the application is really wide from you know, boring to do style software uh, to real-time game applications where you really want to distribute the load. We're also working on zero knowledge and verifiable trust as part of this so that you don't have to worry about the things that are executing on other people's machines. So we're gonna hide that from them. We're gonna use what's known as quantum cryptography to try to keep it from being exposed in the next 10 or 15 years. Um, but we will help you do compute at the edge by hiding some of those things that you don't want your community to see. And the reason why we're spending so much time on this really is kind of if we look at what it would take for you today to go out and launch a P2P network that would do this for you. And these are the, the stats straight from Steam, how many people play, play games on their computer? See, like everybody almost, right? Like so, so these are pretty accurate. Like I know that you probably opened Steam, bought at least one game, and this uh, survey has run on your machine. So what we really see out in the wild is there's still like 10% of people running dual core CPUs playing PC games. I get it, but I, you know, like four, three is like almost minimum now on any you know processor you buy for desktop. Four seems to be pretty standard even on uh, low power machines. So it's crazy to me that 10% of people are still running on a dual core machine. Really, what that means for you though is that if your community is running your software, 10% of them really are are throttling what you can do and you should know about it. You need your P2P network to kind of know, otherwise you can't rely on that software. Then let's look at the speed differences, right? 2.3 gigahertz on the low end to 3.3 gigahertz. I just chose like the three biggest buckets that were in the survey. There's a, there's a bunch of other ones, but like these are huge disparity numbers. That means like the top of the line processor that somebody in your community would be outperforming somebody by 22%. And that doesn't include in special instructions or any of the optimizations that go into each life of a processor. This is just raw instruction cycle clock. So right there again, your top performer is able to do 22% more compute. Shouldn't they get more work? Shouldn't they help your community out more? And, and you probably shouldn't penalize the person that's at the end, right? The low end, right? Like why would we say that they're not allowed uh, to participate or to, to negate or slash them that they should be awarded to? There's, it's a little less uh, important when you kind of look um, at the instruction set, um, but if you look at the ABX 512 CD, I know there's not a lot of cryptographers in the audience, but what it really means is 10% of all of the computers that are running on Steam in this survey are institutional or um, server grade quality. Those are the Xenons. So out of your community of people that are using it, you're lucky if you get 10% of people running a server blade that you can even use. Uh, everybody else is gonna be running an Intel. Uh, these are all Intel numbers, by the way, I didn't pull AMD because AMD is less performant and we can talk about that later if you want. Um, so the big thing is that hardware is viable for a long, long time. And let's look at some really interesting numbers, guys. Um, these are numbers from India and China starting around 2011 as the, as the peak here. And why is this important to us? This is when home ownership of computers in both of these countries eclipsed the United States. This doesn't mean that either of these countries have tapped out a maximum potential for owning computers. This just means they own more than the 300 million people in the United States. There's billions of people in these countries, folks. So there's a lot of compute left to come online. And we're only talking about the two most populous countries. We are talking about most of the countries that are split in the realm of like Africa, where there's still lots of people waiting to come online. The number of spare compute that you're going to get access to is only going to grow, and it would be silly if you negated the fact that your community isn't going to have this in their basement. Get them to pay for your infrastructure. Stop wasting money building your software, giving it away to institutional companies like GCP and AWS who don't even care what you're building. Find the people that care what you're building and get them to run the infrastructure for you. And so now let's dive into a little bit more technicals. I think I got uh, about 15 minutes left here to kind of get through this. But I really kind of want to go through more in detail kind of how we are working on cost-aware scaling or kind of what the mechanism looks like. 
when it happens. Uh, this will be really quick, so feel free to kind of you know stop me and we'll talk about it after. Uh, so right at execution time, as I mentioned, we have like these beacon notes. We send in an execution request, and at that moment in time, the magic happens. We ask every single node to stand up and do a salute. And it's actually self-identifying if it can run the payload that's being requested, either the resources that you're requesting, the program is available in the region that this is in, it has the resources to do it, maybe there's hardware you want, a GPU, an ASIC, access to a temperature control or an external device that isn't there, it will look for the node that has these attributes and that node will say, hey, I can do it, let me do it. Then we take all of those nodes that were like, I'm here and available, but we don't want anybody to really know that they're going to run this work because then you could be an attacker and you could be sitting there waiting for me to say I've got work to do and then you're going to come and you're going to steal my stuff. So I'm going to tell you if you should do work when that happens. So now we have this really awesome selection engine. And if anybody's ever really heard of ELO RPAD, no. Okay, do you play chess? Have you played basketball? Have you played a first person shooter? Yes? Okay then you've been affected by the ELO RPAD match ranking algorithm. So what this thing does is it tracks how good you are as a player through the course of a match. Not your lifetime, just a match. So if you're ranked at a one to one, next you're ranked at two to one, and then three to one, and then four to one, you never really drop, your mastery doesn't decrease, you just get better. That's a really cool algorithm. But um, what it really means for us is that we can compare nodes that are in direct competition with each other and then give them rankings over the life of those nodes as they grow. But then we also do like another thing where we send them on a NASCAR racetrack and we pull rank them based on all of the attributes as well and we watch that come back. And then when we actually do the selection, we simulate that entire process in near real time to find the nodes that will actually probably match the specifications that you have and send that back and we actually do the results and then execute. So, now we actually get to the distribution, and the distribution is really cool too. So we've got the selection algorithm where we selected all of the stuff based on how you previously performed in the network. But now we're going to take that and we're going to make it random again. So now we're going to shuffle those cards so that nobody in this ranking algorithm who's ranked at the top is necessarily going to be the preferred choice. We know that everybody already returns, we know at what time they return, and we know the quality of their return. So we do some really cool math where we do even distribution uh, based on the enumerated capabilities of the machine, and it's just a matrix, so we're really just going in and plugging in the holes based on how much RAM is available on this machine, how much CPU is available on this machine, until everything looks nice and distributed, but it was completely random. So machine A might be getting payload C, and machine B might be getting payload D, and they don't know exactly who's getting what until it happens. And that sounds really complicated and like a lot of stuff to do, so I kind of want to show a demo. Um, I pre-record things because everything. Um, but what we'll see in this demo is I'm actually going to show you like our, our product, our live product that's happening today. You can go out and try it after this if you want. I will warn you, you will have to get into crypto a little bit and download a crypto wallet. Uh, you don't have to have any funds in it, so don't worry about going and like swapping coins. Just get one of the wallets that are listed here, install it, it creates an identity for you. What that really means is it creates a PGP key and it signs things. That's all it's doing. But these are the most common consumer-based ones that we use. And let's see if we can get this to play now. And as you can see, I currently don't have a crypto wallet installed, so this will be what the page looks like. If you come and you don't have one installed, go ahead and pick which wallet you would like to use, depending on the network that you want to participate in. We don't currently take payments, so you don't have to have coin. This is simply used for authentication and identification of your functions on our network currently. Press install, follow the install instructions on the wallet that you chose. Pause this video and head on back when you're ready. Now we're here, I'm gonna go ahead and activate the Kepler wallet. I'll go ahead and refresh the page. And now we have a connect button. We'll hit the connect button for our wallet. We'll be asked to sign a sign-on message, and then we'll go ahead and get inside the dashboard. That easy. Now that we're here, we can hit the Create Function button in the upper right-hand corner. And we will need to connect our GitHub, so we'll go ahead and add our GitHub account. I'm going to go ahead and add it to my personal account, and I'll install and authorize. Feel free to read through all those permissions. 
and we're back at the dashboard and we can connect the function that we already have in a repository or we can start with a simple use case. So here's hello world on the dashboard. Let's go ahead and launch this one. We'll go ahead and give it a name and hit create. Now we're going to wait until the function builds and deploys. Depending on how big the function is, it can take one minute to two minutes. And then we'll just hang out. Uh, I have set this up, by the way. It's, it's running. So it's it's deploying, time. and now it's deployed. Let's go ahead and hit this invocation URL. So now we're going to hit this invocation, and that whole roll call happened. All right. As, as soon as we hit the invocation URL, that whole roll call that I mentioned happened. We went out, and we found a machine to execute that payload and return hello world that fast. So the deploy that was happening was building this assembly on GitHub. We uploaded from GitHub that assembly to IPFS. Then we, not we notified the blacklist network that this assembly had been uploaded and is ready. And then as soon as you get the invocation URL, a request is sent into the P2P network, where we have a bunch of nodes sitting on other Web3 providers, a Kosh network, which is a former alma mater of mine. I have a tattoo here. I'm a diehard in Web3, so please come talk to me about this stuff. Um, we're on Flux. We're on Stack OS. We run on GCP, AWS. Um, I've got one running at my home right now in South Dakota. And so it's picking one of these nodes uh, to actually execute that payload on uh, in real time. And so what the rest of the developer experience, like, I don't want to really weigh down the talk because I think demos are, are kind of boring when you're sitting in an audience. But we have a really nice CLI. You can go and actually work locally. You can spin up a node locally. You can spin up our network locally. It's all documented. And then you can run and actually do all of this without worrying about deploying to somebody else's machine if you want to work and toy around. And maybe you want to work on private things. And then once you're ready, you can actually deploy that to the blockless network. You can use our dashboard. We have SDKs as well. We have Rust. We have assembly script. We have uh, Go Lang support as well. So you can come and build in multiple languages. Um, we also are releasing pretty soon here. We're finishing up. We have support for Next.js static sites. You can actually launch your static website with a dynamic WASM backend on a distributed network like this. And we actually find a round robin just like this and execute your website payload and return the uh, actual contents of your website the same. So you actually get static uh, edge-based CDN built in at no cost with this. Uh, and and, and is, there, is there more? What else is there? So as I mentioned, it's not just scaling via cost. The scaling can be any attributes that are really important to you as a community. So if you're working with specific hardware, GPUs, specific FPGs, if you're working with ASICs that kind of exist in your infrastructure, maybe you're working on a scientific application and you have equipment, and those nodes can have specific attributes based on those to execute whatever that work is. And so you don't really have to worry about managing where your execution goes. You just attribute the nodes that have what you need on it. The extension mechanisms, the software that's running on there, it has like a Redis client. Maybe this one has a Mongo client. Maybe you have access to something else. We can do that for you. As I mentioned, we have sub-networks. So you can deploy this on your own. You can download our software. You can set up your own, what we call a head node, and you can terminate there. And then you can deploy all of the workers that would connect to this head boot. You can actually boot to IPFS. So this is an open network. And you actually can use the global network that has 20,000 some nodes available to do your communication shuffling on as well. You don't even need to use the blockless network. We're actually fairly interoperable with the, with the rest of the community. Um, and so what, what, what do you build with this stuff, right? Like, uh, this is a really, you know, 40 minute talk about a bunch of Web3 technology and I'm leaving it without really having an idea of what I can do. Really the biggest thing that I want to leave you with is that you can build decentralized distributed communities. And so you yourself get the power to start to facilitate your infrastructure footprint by making allies and lovers of your software. And that's the biggest motivator here, is whenever you look to scale, and I think a lot of indie developers especially are kind of hitting this right now, how do you scale without affording costs to yourself? You start to employ your community. You can write web services and applications that are fault tolerant. So if you want to deploy on the blacklist network, 
we'd love to have you. We have a, a, a platform as a service, and we'll make sure that your application is running 365, 24 seven, all the time. We deploy across the globe on several networks, like I mentioned, GCP, AWS, Web3 networks, home owned networks. We're trying to be everywhere. Trustless and verifiable. So this is kind of a shift. I didn't really talk a lot about this during this talk because the audience, I think, is a little bit different here. A lot of you guys are actually building meaningful software that runs lives versus theoretical software. Um, so really what trustless and verifiable mean today is, is very little because the science has not gotten far enough to make this actually super usable in production. But eventually what will happen is you will no longer need to worry about if an application actually ran on somebody's machine and they're just lying to you that it did. We will actually be able to verify through zero knowledge proofing that the machine actually executed, returned results that would have made that possible and are in within those tolerances. And then again, keeping secrets away from people. So allowing you to put really important software on other people's machines. Okay, so what about legacy applications? We've got those. We've got an x86 emulator. You could run on the blockless network. You can run on a P2P network with your current Python, Node.js, uh, C.NET uh, 2.0 Sharp, if you want. Uh, we do have language support then for writing in WASM. So not writing in WASM, you'd have to use our x86 emulator. Writing in WASM, we have to cover. We've got language support again. We've got Go, Rust, Assembly Script, and we'll keep growing that. We're bringing you the SDKs to make writing these applications easy. You don't have to deal with integers or floats. You don't have to worry about really boring C-level pointers. Uh, services and third parties. As I mentioned, there's like 300 plus Web3 services. We are collapsing these for you. We are creating abstractions around storage mechanisms. We're creating abstractions around minting mechanisms. If you wanted to create an NFT or anything that's in the crypto world, we've also got you covered in those mechanisms. If you want to do coin swaps, I know that's not a lot, maybe what a lot of people are interested in, but we can help facilitate those kind of secure transactions, even in other scenarios where there's third parties that may not be trusted. We're also extensible. So we do have an extensibility system built in. You can actually download the software and you can extend it yourself today using a, a DLL system or a CGI system. So if you have a really complicated base, piece of software that you want to put in here, you can actually drive it with blockless nodes and just write a really simple CGI abstraction around it. And so how can, you, uh, how can you get involved and become part of the team? Because this is an open source community and this is an open source conference and open source means we should all be working in the open and sharing and, and, and come check this stuff out, guys. So uh, you can start building on block lists. Uh, we are testing now, we're generally available. Come kick the tires, tell me how much it sucks, tell me what you don't like. Don't tell me what you do like, tell me what you don't like so we can fix it. Uh, launch a local node to test. Really, give it give it the full uh, workout. Maybe write a CGI extension. And if you're really interested, I can help you get into protocol development and you can help write the really boring stuff. All right, so how do you learn more? We're wrapping up the talk here. I think I just made it to time. Uh, Blockless Network, the docs, uh, Twitter, the Blockless, we're very, very active on there. You'll find Discord. This is a, a link tree, so it's got a bunch of other links on it if you want to scan that in. Uh, really just, uh, you know, thank you so much for your time today. I uh, really enjoyed talking to you. I hope to talk to a lot of you out in the audience or out in the, in the uh, halls. Whoops. Um, again, Derek Anderson for Blockless. Thank you again for your time. Thank you.